Putin was desperate when he asked North Korea's Kim Jong-un for soldiers. And now it seems that things aren't going exactly as he had hoped. In fact, we have reports that North Korean soldiers are actually shooting at Russian soldiers. Who would have thought the first country to help Ukraine attack Russian soldiers would be North Korea? Not me. And it seems that's not the only issue. The Russians and North Korean soldiers are just not gelling well. I guess you could say they're not meant for each other, especially on the battlefield. They are having numerous difficulties that's going viral on social media because Russian soldiers are just not able to take it anymore fighting alongside North Korean soldiers who they already have a language barrier with, but the problems are beyond just language. Last week we covered how in an intercepted communication audio we can hear Russian soldiers complaining about their North Korean counterparts and now we have even more video evidence showing that Russia and North Korea are just not having a good time fighting together. So let's get into all that and more in today's video. Like always, be sure to hit the like button down below. Our videos have a habit of getting targeted by Putin's bot whenever we criticize Russia. So your likes help us out tremendously in the algorithm and let's begin. First, we have a report of a Russian soldier surrendering to Ukraine to save his own life. He goes on to explain that North Korean soldiers are actually shooting in the wrong direction and they took out two Russians. So in order to save his life, he figured he's better off surrendering to Ukrainians. Here's the video. They brought in 10 Koreans and sent us to the forest to dig trenches. They give all the warm clothing and food to Koreans. During the assault, the Koreans started firing at us. We tried to explain where to aim, but I think they shot two of our own. I decided it was better to surrender in this situation than to be killed by our own bullet. See, this is what I don't understand, because someone as stupid as me can see that there are gonna be language barriers when North Koreans and Russian troops fight together. That's why many people on YouTube, people a lot smarter than me, have pointed out that Russia is probably not gonna use them together. The plan was to put North Korean troops all together and send them in for a mission, and then Russian troops would either relocate to the Ukrainian front lines or they would go somewhere else, right? The plan was to line up these North Korean troops in the Kursk region or send them around the border with China or something, right? No one knew for sure, but everyone kind of agreed on one thing. It's not going to be a situation where they work together with Russian soldiers. But it seems that's exactly what's happening. So unless I'm missing something that's militarily above my head, it seems to me that Russian commanders are just making a big mistake again, which I guess I shouldn't be too surprised at considering these were the same commanders who expected to take Kyiv in three days. But here we are. <laughs> but another issue that I've been seeing on social media the reports about is the food that these North Korean troops are eating. Just to remind everyone, North Korea has one of the lowest food security in the world of any nation. They're in fact going through one of their worst famine since 1990s and hundreds of thousands of people sleep hungry every single night. Now, of course, there is that argument that this is not a failure of the North Korean regime. In fact, it's a feature because if citizens are always hungry, there's a lower chance that they will revolt against the government. But putting all that aside, it seems obvious that when people are this desperate, they like to innovate to find calories wherever they can, you know, think outside of the box. So one of that habit is apparently not sitting right with Russian soldiers. So yeah, just watch it yourself. Hello, I saw online that our guys got a hold of these cans and ate them. And here, our guys also got the same crap from our brotherly nation. They decided to try it, but one person thought to translate. He took a translator and found out that it's a dog meat, damn it. Meat of a dog, they ate it, damn it and didn't even know what they were eating. Next time, you can translate this crap and find out what you're putting in your mouth. Now, you would think that Russian soldiers are having so many issues on the battlefield, the Russian officials would at least make a comment or try to help them out in any way possible, right? Well, guess what Russian officials are doing? They're worried about the US collapsing. 
Dmitry Medvedev, the former president of Russia and current deputy of the Security Council in Russia, is saying that he doesn't really understand the rule-based order that US has created. Saying that US order will collapse and Russia should nuke US. He's talking about US so much, all the while 23% of Russians still don't have indoor plumbing. Almost a quarter of Russians. And Russia likes to call itself a superpower. He's saying that where Russian casualties on the battlefield are approaching 700,000. Just in few days, we'll have the number reach 700,000. This is by far the deadliest period for Russian soldiers since the World War II. And their officials are worried about USA. Hear it for yourself. I kept asking myself a question. The Americans and their satellites keep saying, you are violating a rule-based order. When you ask them what this order is, for this purpose, I have been deliberately digging into legal texts, studying them. It is not clear what it is, not clear who approved it and what order this is. In fact, it is simply an understanding by the US and its allies, but first of all, NATO, how it is profitable to run the business around the world. That means it's an unwritten document. It's not an international convention. It's not an act of the UN or any other. Not a charter of the UN. It's just something, an order that they think is right. And once you're outside that order, you're a lawbreaker. Certainly, it is a very unstable structure, which sooner or later will collapse, and those who are inside this order will suffer the most. I'm absolutely sure about that. Now anyways, North Korea is not just helping Russia with soldiers. In fact, they've been helping Russia way before North Korean soldiers touched down in Russia. They've been sending millions and millions of shells to Russia. But in fact, so far we had figures that most of these shells did not work. We were predicting or I guess reports were estimating that it was around 50% that were not working and the rest were working. Well, we now have new reports and it seems that only 1 out of 5 shells work. So only 20% of them actually work, which kind of makes sense. North Korea hasn't used these shells for probably decades now, and they likely don't have a maintenance program to keep this in a working condition. So they're extremely rusted, as you guys will see pretty soon. But even then, even if a small percentage of them work, we have to keep in mind that North Korea is sending a lot. The numbers vary anywhere from 3 million to almost 9 million that's on the way. So numbers make up for the poor quality, or I guess poor hit rate. But here's the clip of Russian soldiers cleaning up a North Korean shipment that just arrived. That's us preparing the ammo, cleaning off rust, sorting and packing. I'm cleaning, Lyosha, not we are cleaning. Someone's task is to film, others... Yes, I'm managing the process. <laughs> now recently we had former SEAL Team 6 commander Chuck Farr on our podcast and he is by far one of the most knowledgeable guy I know when it comes to the Ukrainian war and he shared his thoughts as to why the North Korean troops are in Russia and on top of that he explains why we've been hearing about so many mishaps with the Russian army and the big reason he points out is the fact that these Russian soldiers that are now hitting the front lines are just not properly trained like he actually goes as far as to call them people because he explains how they're not really trained so you can't really call them soldiers they're just normal people that russia is sending to the front line and this kind of goes in with something we have covered earlier and it's the strategy that russia uses near trenches and like you know when they try to take ground in ukraine and basically the strategy is to send in untrained low-skilled soldiers first and the whole goal of this first wave is to die basically their goal is to run out the ammunition that the ukrainian soldiers have so later on, the second wave or even the third wave comes in that are a little bit more advanced, a little bit more trained Russian soldiers, and they actually do the fighting. So that's why Russia is facing so many casualties, because their whole strategy, much like the Soviet Union, is built upon having their people die. And it's the battle of attrition, basically. So let's hear this from Chuck Farr. He explains it much better than I could. More than a score of North Korean ballistic missiles have been fired at Ukrainian cities. It was not Russian soldiers who fired those missiles. Those missile launchers did not come over with their instruction manuals tran translated into Russian. It was, it was North Korean troops who fired them. Per se, there are North Korean troops in combat in Ukraine because of that. A number of North Korean officers have been killed in a targeted strike by Ukraine 
This was in an area contiguous to the zero line. We know that 19 North Korean troops have already uh, defected. They have, they have left their places. We also know this isn't very often reported that Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps members are also in Ukraine. They deal with the Shahid uh, drones and they facilitate training. And in the early stages of the Shahid's debut, it was Iranians who were launching them. These are things definitely to keep a mind on. The very short answer to that question, are North Korean forces in occupied Ukraine, are they combatants? In my estimation, they already are. If you're shooting a missile at a Ukrainian city, you're in the yeah, fight. 100%, that makes sense. Uh, talking about troops, Russia, as you said, insanely, they the, the most deadliest week they have had since the war started. And they are recruiting roughly 30,000 new troops per month to fill the gap, I'm guessing. Are they well-trained troops, the new troops that are coming in? Is, there gonna, is that going to affect as we go into the fight into the winter, all these new troops that are coming in? Well, that's one of the problems that Russia is already in uh, what Colonel John Spencer and I last year called the training death loop. We, we hear from Russian soldiers themselves that they often receive less than two weeks training before they, they find themselves on the zero line. And it essentially takes them two weeks to get there. So they're not really training, they're sitting on trains and buses and transit camps. So they arrive at the zero line without the fundamental training that a soldier needs, right? In the United States, it takes almost a year for an infantryman to receive his training. Basic training, infantry school, and some advanced schools, it takes basically 18 months to make a ranger. He'll go through all of those training, then ranger school, then jump school. It takes two years to train a Green Beret, two years to train a Navy SEAL. So you've got these people arriving on the battlefield. Notice I didn't say soldiers. These people, they don't know how to do the fundamental skills of a soldier, shoot, move, and communicate, right? You have to know how to use all the weapon systems you're supposed to be using, not just a rifle, mortars, RPGs, except dozens of weapons. They don't know how to use them. They don't know anything about land navigation. You give them a compass and a map and they look at it like a hog looking at a wristwatch. So those are some of the reasons that these soldiers arrive. Russia can only carry out daylight assaults. They can only do operations in broad daylight. And we've all seen what a first-person drone will do to a soldier in broad daylight. So they're recruiting 30,000 people a month. They lose 30,000 people a month. And the quality of the individual soldier keeps going down. YouTube is still not a fan of a lot of topics we cover. And that means the videos get restricted and demonetized. That's why we recently launched memberships and Patreons. This way you guys can support the content we make directly if you're able to. Because we want to continue covering this type of topics even if advertisers don't like it. We like doing it and hopefully you guys like watching it. That's why Patreon and memberships give us a way to continue doing this without worrying about YouTube demonetizing our videos. So if you're interested and you're able to support us, you can do so by joining our Patreon or becoming a member on YouTube. The QR codes will be on the screen and the links in the description. Your support is greatly, greatly appreciated. Russian plane takes down another Russian aircraft. I bet that wasn't something Putin was expecting when he launched his special three-day military operation into Ukraine in 2022. But here we are, Russian military has become a joke in front of the whole world. Just a week ago, Russian nuclear missile exploded in the silo and now, a Russian jet attacks and takes down its own aircraft in a friendly fire. What makes this situation even worse is the fact that the aircraft was downed in a Ukrainian controlled territory. So I'm sure Ukrainian forces and even some Western forces are now excited to learn about all the technological progress Russia has made for this aircraft. First, here's the clip of the attack happening.
Now, this report recently came out, so the exact model of the aircraft that was shot down is still changing. But here's the initial report. But before we start, quick reminder to just hit the like button down below. Russian bots often downvote videos that are critical of Putin or Russia, and I'm sure they're not going to be happy with this video. So if you can just hit the like button down below, it helps us out tremendously in the algorithm. Thank you. Russia lost another aircraft in Donetsk Oblast. This morning, initial reports suggested that Russian Su-25 ground attack jet was shot down. The plane crashed in Ukraine-controlled that region. Later footage emerged showing that it was destroyed in another friendly fire incident. <laughs> the Ukrainian Telegram channel shared a video of the attack on the aircraft and noted, the plane that was catching up with the second one was flying on two jet engines and the first one that crashed was on one had full tanks. Moreover, it turned out that it wasn't a Su-25. In the next tweet, there are more angles of the attack happening and the aircraft coming down, crashing down, I guess. So let's watch that real quick. Later on, as more time passed, the more information about the aircraft that was down came out. Aircraft was the Sukhoi S-70, which is a Russian heavy stealth unmanned combat aerial vehicle. Still in development, it incorporates technology from the alleged 5th generation Sukhoi Su-57 fighter jet. It has a wingspan of 20 meters and is equipped with two internal weapon bays capable of carrying 2,000 kilograms of both guided and unguided munitions, optimizing its stealth and combat capabilities. Kyiv Post had more information on this and this is apparently Russia's most advanced drone costing about $15 million each. And the Russian jet took it down in friendly fire. Just another item in the long list of Russian military embarrassment. First, Russia became the first country with nukes to be invaded by a country that doesn't even have nukes. Putin became the first sitting president in the history of the world to have an arrest warrant against him. And now, this. But I guess there's some good news for Russia and if you're a Russian supporter still watching this video, I don't know why you are. Russia was able to capture another one of Ukrainian's town, Vohaldar. But at what cost? Apparently, Russia's elite units suffered more losses in this year-long battle for this town than they did in 10 years in Chechnya. And the big reason Ukrainians had to give up their positions is because Ukraine isn't allowed to use the same weapons the same way Russians are using it. That's because the West has still not given permission to Ukraine to strike inside Russia, strike military bases and airfields that Russia is using to strike Ukraine and Ukrainian positions. Here's President Zelensky explaining the same thing. Why are we so insistent on using long-range weapons? Without it, we cannot stop Russia, which is using such weapons against us. They are destroying everything, destroying the positions of our soldiers. We must protect their lives because they are more important than any buildings. These are our people, citizens of Ukraine. As we talked at the beginning of the video, the Russian military is laughable. Russia is losing this war, but it has one thing that's working for it. And that's nukes. Not even nukes, in fact, just the warnings about using nukes. And that has held back West from giving permission to Ukraine to create chaos in Russia, strike military bases, and strike airfields. Here's a clip from Times Radio explaining this better than- If we just think about it deeply for a second, it just goes to show how weak Putin truly is. If Russia, which according to Putin is the second largest military, second strongest military in the world, cannot beat Ukraine without yelling about how they can use nukes, they can nuke the whole world. It just goes to show how weak Putin is and how weak the Russian military is. Here's another clip expanding on the same thinking. Now, earlier we did cover how Russia had a nuclear missile blow up in its own silo before it even took off. So let's get into that segment right now. Russian nuclear missile explodes in Russia. <laughs> For everyone that loves to laugh, Russia is a gift that just keeps on giving. First, Russia became the first country in the world to have nukes and still get invaded. Then, Putin became the first Russian leader to lose territory since World War II. And now, Russian nuclear missiles are exploding in Russia. In fact, it exploded in the test site where it was supposed to launch from. 
What makes this situation even more laughable was the fact that this was not just a normal test that Russia was running to see if their missiles work or not. This was a show of force and it was a kind of show of force that they built up a lot of excitement for. The foreign minister Sergei Lavrov went on a big interview with Sky News where he basically gave a warning that Russia's nukes are locked and loaded. And then the plan was to show off this test as a signal to the world, as a signal to the West and NATO that Russia is not afraid to use its nukes. But unfortunately, the missile never took off. And the pictures and the videos that are coming out from the area are just truly comical. So let's get into all that in today's video and more. But first, I have a quick request for you guys. Sometimes our videos get downwarded heavily by Russian bots who just want to kill the reach of any video that criticizes Russia and Putin. So if you can just take a second to hit the like button below and share the video on your social media, that helps us out tremendously in the algorithm. Now let's start. Putin recently did this fake press conference where he answered just one question. And the question was, what would Russia do if NATO gives Ukraine permission to strike inside Russia using Western weapons? The big reason he did this was there was a lot of news at least last week that NATO, more specifically the US, was leaning heavily towards giving Ukraine permission to strike inside Russia using Western weapons. Now clearly this is something Putin cannot afford in a war that's already going so horribly for Russia. So he did a press conference to send out a message to NATO saying that if NATO gives permission, that would mean NATO is at war with Russia. And just a reminder again, Russia is not afraid to use its nukes. So I guess after this interview, the world had a new red line, which would be the hundredth one in this war that Russia has given. Now, a lot of experts, a lot of people a lot smarter than me, clearly saw this as what it was. It was a bluff that Russia was using to stop the West from helping Ukraine even more. Just hear from Ben Hodges yourself. But the thing People didn't take it as seriously. So Russia had to up the stakes. Go a step further in their bluff, if you know what I mean. First, we had Dmitry Medvedev, the former Russian president who said this in a Telegram post. Russia has been patient. It is obvious that a nuclear response is a hugely complex decision with irreversible consequences. What arrogant Anglo-Saxon dimwits fail to admit, though, is that you can only test someone's patience for so long. It will turn out in the end that certain moderate Western analysts were right when they warned, true, the Russians are not likely to use this response, although it's still a possibility. Besides, they may use new delivery vehicles with conventional payloads. And then it's over. A giant blot of molten gray mass in the place where the mother of Russian cities, historical name of Kiev, once stood. Holy shit, it's impossible, but it happened. The problem is no one takes Medvedev seriously. And here's the proof. This is what the US Department of State said after the Medvedev statement. Quote, we know by now not to take Medvedev seriously. This is standard Kremlin nonsense, end quote. So Russia had to pull out the big guns. And by that, what I mean, they were gonna test a nuclear missile and show the world that Russia is capable of what it's saying. Russia can use nukes if the West does not take it seriously. So the whole plan was the foreign ministry of Russia, which is Sergei Lavrov, he's gonna go give this big speech where he's gonna warn the West, warn NATO. And then right after the meeting, Russia is gonna conduct this big test that's gonna be show of force to everyone who thinks Russia is not serious. But it didn't exactly go as planned. So first, let's go over the statement that Sergei Lavrov did, and then we'll look at the test and how it went. There is a question in the context of references to Russia's use of nuclear weapons. We know about the Russian Federation's doctrine in this sphere. Each time the red lines are crossed, the question arises as to where they really lie in the context of nuclear weapons. We talk about the red lines in the hope that our assessments and statements will be heard by clever decision makers. It is silly to say that we will push the red button if tomorrow you fail to do as I demand. I am confident that the decision makers are aware of what we mean in these situations. No one wants a nuclear war. We said this time and again. Let me assure you that we have weapons whose use will involve grave consequences for the masters of the Ukrainian regime. These weapons are available and on full alert status. Alright, so after this, the plan was to use the new Russian missile in a test flight as a show of force to the world. The missile to be used was RS-28 Sarmat, 
or it's commonly known as Satan 2. I would like to point out that this is not a Soviet era missile, so it's not an old one. This is actually a relatively new Russian weapon that was unveiled in March 2018 and the first test flight took place in April 2022, right after the invasion started. Now we already know all the old Soviet style weapons are breaking down on the front line for Russia, but this is a brand new missile that Russia has been boasting about as a huge accomplishment for their defense industry. And as you'll soon see, the failure was massive. As you can see from the tweet on your screen, Russians prepared a test launch of one of their RS-28 Sarmat ballistic missiles. However, the test failed before it even started. Apparently, the missile exploded on the ground during the fueling process, destroying the whole silo and most of the launch site. Here you can see the image of the silo which is pretty much destroyed and soon I'll show you the before and after so you can see how it looked like before. But some people may question how a missile was able to destroy the whole testing site before even taking off. Well, that's because the missile had fuel enough to travel around 18,000 kilometers or roughly 11,000 miles. So when things went wrong, all that fuel went boom. Here you can see the before and after of the launch site which clearly shows there was an explosion and the site was destroyed. The big reason we have to use satellite maps and satellite imagery is because of course Russia is never gonna admit this went horribly wrong. And the reason we know that this went horribly wrong is because of open source intelligence. By the way, important note before moving on, these missile tests don't actually have a nuclear warhead attached to them because after all they are just tests so they just have a fake warhead for data taking purposes. But anyways, Peter Zihan does bring up a good point here. We already know that Russia's Soviet era weapons are falling apart. The big reason we know this is because at the start of the war, Ukrainian forces carefully examined Russian weapons recovered from the battlefield, hoping to learn any insights that could give them an edge. Maybe they could tweak and improve their own gear to turn the tables on Russians and give them a taste of their own medicine. But. After a thorough inspection, the Ukrainians quickly realized that most of Russian weapons were outdated and unreliable. In fact, they were so bad that compared to modern Western weapons, the Ukrainians outright called them, and I quote, ineffective and obsolete. On top of that, it's important to note that this was not a Soviet era missile. In fact, this was a relatively new missile, which took its first test flight in April 2022. Unfortunately, that was the one and only successful test flight it ever had. Since then, the missile has failed four times. Maybe it's time we consider that Russian nuke arsenal may be in as pure of a shape as everything else in the Russian military. After all, the nuclear weapons do require a very high maintenance to keep them in ready form. Recently, we learned that because of corruption, the Chinese missiles were filled with water instead of fuel because soldiers were just taking out the fuel and selling it for personal profit. Now, Russia is no better when it comes to corruption. In fact, Kursk invasion was made possible because of corruption in Russia. I think the Russian government spent hundreds of millions of dollars fortifying the border, but when Ukrainian forces came across the border, Putin realized that the person responsible for fortifying the border in fact just pocketed the money and did a very lousy job that made it possible for Ukraine to invade Russia. But anyways, this doesn't mean that the bluffs from Russia will stop. Just last week, we had a close advisor to Putin come on Times Radio and say if Ukraine gets permission to use Storm Shadow missiles inside Russia, a missile that's from UK, then Putin will be forced to attack Britain. Now, I know that might be hard to believe, but listen to it yourself. If Russia gets- Now, of course, they're not just gonna attack Britain. They're also going to attack Poland and Romania because after all, the attack in Ukraine is going so well for Russia. But anyways, Michael Clark had a perfect response to this, just reminding Russia that Britain has nuclear weapons too. Before we get into that though, let's listen to the Putin press conference that everyone is just repeating from Russia's side. We are seeing is an attempt to substitute notions. Because this is not a question of whether the Kiev regime is allowed or not allowed to strike targets on Russian territory. It is already carrying out strikes using unmanned aerial vehicles and other means. But using Western-made long-range precision weapons is a completely different story. The fact is that I have mentioned this and any expert both in our country and in the West will confirm this. The Ukrainian army is not capable of using cutting-edge high-precision long-range systems supplied by the West. They cannot do that. 
These weapons are impossible to employ without intelligence data from satellites which Ukraine does not have. This can only be done using the European Union's satellites or US satellites in general NATO satellites. This is the first point. The second point, perhaps the most important, the key point even, is that only NATO military personnel can assign flight missions to these missile systems. Ukrainian servicemen cannot do this. Therefore, it is not a question of allowing the Ukrainian regime to strike Russia with these weapons or not. It is about deciding whether NATO countries become directly involved in the military conflict or not. If this decision is made, it will mean nothing short of direct involvement. It will mean that NATO countries, the United States and European countries are parties to the war in Ukraine. This will mean their direct involvement in the conflict and it will clearly change the very essence, the very nature of the conflict dramatically. This will mean that NATO countries, the United States and European countries are at war with Russia. And if this is the case, then bearing in mind the change in the essence of the conflict, we will make appropriate decisions in response to the threats that will be posed to us. Now let's listen to Michael Clark's response. When people think it's there. Now this Russia-Ukraine war, much like any geopolitical event, it's moving very fast and it's pretty much impossible to keep up with all the news. That's why we launched Global Recap, a geopolitical newsletter that covers the world news in a quick and simple way. Every day we send out an email directly to your inbox that covers the most important geopolitical news that you can read in less than 5 minutes. Trust me, cause I do it every day. Best of all, it's completely free and you can sign up now by using the link in the description or scanning the QR code. Sign up now and become more knowledgeable about the world you live in.